So students, staff, faculty, welcome. I don't think you know, students, how lonely and dead it is here every summer uh, without you, but we are so glad to have you back. It is good to have this community together again. I still feel somewhat amazed and deeply privileged to be here with you as I start my third year as president of Hampshire College. That means I'm still a Div 2, <laughs> and I still have time to figure out what I'm going to do for my Div 3, right? <laughs> so I'll be taking uh, feedback and searching for a committee. Um, as I look at what's happening in the world, the pace and unpredictability of change, the level of conflict and injustice that surrounds us, it strikes me all over again how apt and how important this enterprise of ours is. Learner-centered, inquiry-driven education that values questions above answers, that celebrates exploration, and that demands that student find the means to put ideas into action that seems to me the best possible preparation for an unpredictable world in need of the engagement of caring citizens. One characteristic of the Hampshire community that is intrinsic to who we are and how we share the experience of learning is that we are a community of purpose and activism as well as a community of inquiry. We seek moral as well as analytical understanding. Convocation, as Ava said, is a celebration of who we are and a renewal of our community. Today, I would like to use the occasion to open a conversation about one form of injustice that is of immediate concern to American society as a whole and to this community in particular, the presence and consequences of racism. This, I have to tell you, is not an easy or a comfortable subject for a 60-year-old white male who grew up with all the benefits of white privilege. Racism is not something I can claim to understand at anything but an intellectual level or even to be free of myself. But for exactly that reason, racism is an issue I feel compelled to address I hope by doing so to open a discussion that moves us from passive to active anti-racism and helps us to fulfill our commitments as a learning community. I want to start with a, a little history and context. When I was born at the end of World War II, the United States Armed Forces, 12 million men and women who had just finished fighting a brutal war against tyranny, those armed forces were racially segregated. Indeed, while unsung heroes, people whose names most of us have never and will never hear, had struggled, suffered, and sometimes died trying to get access to education, services, and the ballot box in the 20s and 30s, America as a whole remained segregated. Throughout the South, schools and public facilities were segregated by law, as they were by practice in many parts of the North. Theaters, swimming pools, restaurants, and sports were segregated. People's minds were segregated. By the end of the decade after World War II, President Truman integrated the armed forces by executive order. He had to fire the Secretary of the Army who refused to implement the order of his commander-in-chief. Jackie Robinson and Branch Rickey desegregated the major leagues. And in 1954, the United States Supreme Court unanimously held segregation unconstitutional. The United States, finally, 90 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, began slowly to dismantle the explicit, socially accepted, legally enforced structures of institutional racism. The court's ruling that segregation was unconstitutional, however, did not settle the issue. Rather, it marked the beginning of the next stage of the struggle. In the spring of 1963, school children in Birmingham, Alabama were standing up to police dogs and fire hoses turned on them by Sheriff Bull Connor, who proclaimed segregation at any 
price. When those children demonstrated for equal rights, he turned the fire hoses on them. A senior in high school, I somehow persuaded my parents to let me take time off from school and drive to Birmingham as a witness and supporter of justice. I had never seen raw malignancy or hateful violence before. That stunned me. But neither had I seen such courage before. The children who sang and held hands in the face of attack dogs, fire hoses, and truncheons changed my understanding of what was possible. In 1965, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act to assure the most fundamental of rights against flagrant efforts to prevent blacks from voting. The same Voting Rights Act the Supreme Court has just partially struck down, but more on that in a moment. In 1974, 20 years after the Supreme Court had commanded that desegregation must be dismantled at, quote, all deliberate speed, the federal judge, whom I was a law clerk for, heard the appeal of the Boston parents still fighting against desegregation, in this case, protesting busing to integrate the Boston schools. That was long before the war on terror, but the court was enveloped in security and surrounded by angry white parents screaming epithets at the judges. I was incredibly proud to have been part of the court's strong endorsement of the plan issued a short time later. When the plan was implemented, it was again the children, children of color, who were on the front line of the struggle. Change came slowly, grudgingly, incompletely, and at great cost, but it did come. Yet the system of segregation, of legally enforced racism, left a stubborn leg legacy, most obviously in lasting patterns of prejudice and social, economic, and educational disadvantage for people of color, but also in the hearts and minds of white people. For myself, and I think for the rest of us here who are white, how can our perceptions, assumptions, and expectations not have been shaped by the prevalent racism and disparities of opportunity and experience between whites and people of color? How can we not be cursed with unconscious racism? Not malevolent, not hateful, certainly not intentional, but destructive nevertheless. Habits of the heart that generate suspicion, fear, and anger that we respond to unawares. Study after study of the effects of unconscious bias has shown that it leads to differential and disadvantageous treatment of people of color across American society, in healthcare, in hiring, in housing, in pay, in banking, in law enforcement, and of course, in education. I'd never read all this literature before the last couple of months, but the documentation is stunning. And the extent to which people who think of themselves as people of goodwill found that they too were driven by unknown springs of unconscious racism. In this year of Trayvon Martin, we need to look in our own hearts for the silently lurking stereotypes and unacknowledged fears that shape our perceptions. The court that halted New York's stop and frisk uh, policy documented massive evidence that in its operation and in its effect, it was a racial profiling policy. In 2012 alone, more than half a million people were stopped and frisked. 90% of them were black or Latino. 89% were totally innocent of any offense whatsoever. Yet this was a policy that New York officials had long supported and upheld, insisting that it was not racist, but based on objective criteria. Ta-Nehisi Coates, a senior editor at The Atlantic and a black man wrote in a New York Times op-ed titled, The Good Racist People, quote, in modern America, we believe racism to be the property of the uniquely villainous and morally deformed, the ideology of trolls, gorgons, and orcs. We believe this even when we are actually being racist. From here in the Pioneer Valley, it is easy to condemn the Zimmerman verdict. 
and to express indignation that the activist conservatives on the Supreme Court have voided a key section of the Voting Rights Act, deeming it no longer necessary because those days are behind us. We are right to protest. There is no guarantee but the vigilance of citizens that our society will not slip backwards. But I hope our community will also confront a question closer to home. How are we to overcome racism that is neither conscious nor intended nor far away but in ourselves? It will be much harder to open a conversation about the effects of unconscious racism in our own classrooms, dorms, and offices, but much more important, I think, for this community. Here's what I ask of the entire Hampshire community, that we commit to honesty, openness, and respect toward one another, that we each take responsibility to challenge race-based assumptions, stereotypes, and actions when we see them, and to acknowledge them when we find them in ourselves. That's hard. That will take courage and a conscious rejection of the natural defensiveness we all feel when challenged, especially on race. It will take generosity of spirit such that when we challenge each other, we do it in good faith, not to punish, but to engage, teach, and learn. Have any of you watched the video of Jay Smooth's presentation at the Hampshire TEDx uh, conference? He's fabulous. I recommend it to you if you haven't seen it. He spoke about this issue with wisdom and with humor. He talked about the incredible difficulty of this conversation and how rare but important it is for both the giver and the receiver of feedback to keep focused on what happened or what was said, not on whether the speaker or doer is a racist. He urged that we keep in mind that, quote, we are not good despite our imperfections. It is the connection we maintain with our personal and common imperfections that allows us to be good to ourselves and to others. Hampshire alum Ken Burns, uh, when I asked for his thoughts about what I should say this afternoon, because I remembered that he'd said on this stage, everything I've ever done is about race. He wrote to me, quote, most of us make the mistake of seeing race and African American history as some politically correct addendum to American history, like the outer orbit of Pluto, and not the burning sun at the heart of our history and our potential future redemption. Race, he says, is at the center of our lives, our original sin. We were born under the sign that all men are created equal, and yet the man who wrote those words owned more than 100 human beings. Setting in motion an American narrative, constantly forced to confront race, always has, always will. I think that un that understanding is crucial if we aspire at Hampshire to be actively anti-racist. It's frightening to me to recognize what Ken says, but I think it offers profound opportunity for learning and growth. So what shall we do? I have some things to propose, and then I'm going to spend weeks asking you for your ideas. We will organize, of course, discussions, seminars, and training events around issues of race. We will support the work of interns who will organize conversations in their residences, uh, residences about these topics. Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, founder and leader of the Critical Race Theory Intellectual Movement, will deliver the Ekbal Lecture later this fall, followed by a panel organized by Professor Margaret Cerullo on the Trayvon Martin case. Hampshire students are organizing the Ask for Social Justice Conference here in November. This spring, we will celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Cultural Center. I've charged Chief Diversity Officer Diana Fernandez with cr crafting a statement about the core role of diversity in Hampshire's vision of education and with working with every division of the school on an agenda for addressing racism. This spring, I will take a delegation from Hampshire to the NCOR conference in Indianapolis. That's a start but I'm counting on the activism and commitment of the Hampshire community to push forward much more than that we can do. 
I am neither wise enough nor experienced enough with these issues to know exactly how to proceed. I will be asking you, students, staff, faculty, to think and to propose and to create and to help us chart the path forward. The most important work that we can do, I think, will be to react to what we see around us in real time. This is not a side issue. It is at the core of the exploration of understanding at Hampshire. Last week, President Obama, speaking on the anniversary of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, said, quote, to dismiss the magnitude of our progress, to suggest, as some sometimes do, that little has changed, that dishonors the courage and the sacrifice of those who paid the price to march in those years, Medgar Evers, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, Martin Luther King, Jr. They did not die in vain, their victory was great. But we dishonor those heroes as well to suggest that the work of this nation is somehow complete. The arc of the moral universe may bend toward justice, but it does not bend on its own. Anyone who has been part of the Hampshire community over the last few years knows I am passionate about building a culture of sustainability here. But I know in the depths of my heart that sustainability cannot be built on injustice. Justice and sustainability are a symbiotic pair. I think this community can lead on both. I ask you to join me in trying. Thank you.